Now I'm on. Welcome, everyone. So how many of you have gone over to see the first folio yet? Raise your hand. I still see a few hands of people who have not made their way over there. The first folio is on display in Special Collections through September 29th. You can go after, right after this. Um, they're open till 7 p.m. The Libraries is really honored for this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to host the f Shakespeare's first folio in Las Vegas as the folios are touring around the country for, um, in celebration of 400 years of Shakespeare's legacy. It's been 400 years since Shakespeare died. Um, as many of you know, um, the first folio includes 36 of Shakespeare's plays, 18 of which had never been published before. So if his two actor friends hadn't pulled all these plays together six to seven years after his death and published them, we might never have um, come to appreciate or know about Macbeth, Twelfth Night, The Tempest, As You Like It. They all might have been lost forever. So we can really thank this book for the lasting legacy of Shakespeare. So 750 folios survive. Um, 750 folios were printed about 235 of them survive, and 82 of them are at, actually at the Folger Shakespeare Library. So they're letting about a dozen out to go around the country to 52 stops, and we are the only stop in Nevada. They're really important to our culture. They're very valuable. The most expensive one ever sold at auction was for $6 million. So if you want to see what a $6 million book looks like, go over there. <laughs> um, but with such an incredible resource, it's taken a lot to make this happen. So I do have a couple people to thank, a couple people, a lot of people to thank and a number of organizations. First of all, the Folger Shakespeare Library, the American Library Association, the Cincinnati Museum, um, the National Endowment for the Humanities, Google, and other sponsors have really allowed this national tour uh, to take place. But there have been many, many staff within the libraries that have also helped um, plan this event, keep special collections open um, for many hours so that we can host um, the folio. And we've been putting on over 15 events, and so many people throughout the university have helped make that possible. You might not realize it, but campus facilities also did an an immense amount of work getting at the perfect climate over in the um, special collections area. So go over there and feel the cool temperature and the high humidity. You can appreciate that. So we hope all of these events that we're hosting will make your experience of seeing a first folio in person much richer and more inspiring. But now I want to introduce our speaker for today, and thank you for doing this, um, Dr. Leslie Cross. She is an assistant professor of theater in the College of Fine Arts who specializes in Shakespearean performance and text in 19th century American theater and popular entertainment. Her published articles and book reviews appear in the journals Shakespeare Bulletin, the Journal of American Drama and Theater, and Theater Survey, as well as the book projects Shakespeare Expressed, Page, Stage, and Classroom, as well as Performing Objects and Theatrical Things. Her book manuscript, and I think you'll be talking about this today, the Edwin Booth Prompt Books, A Social and Theatrical History, tracks the production and reception of 19th century actor Edwin Booth's Shakespearean acting editions. She also works at regional theaters across America, including the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Classic Stage Company, and Actors Theater of Louisville. So please welcome Professor Cross. Thank you. I have to raise this for being a tall person. Okay, great. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. So today I'm going to share with you some research from my in-progress book project uh, entitled The Edwin Booth Prompt Books, A Social and Theatrical History. My talk today is drawn from the first half of the book, so I'll be doing some teasers for the second half of the book that you'll just all have to wait for. Um, uh, and the book, as uh, mentioned, tracks the editing, publication, and sales of Edwin Booth's prompt book editions of Shakespeare. So first, I wanted to introduce you to Edwin Booth, or as I affectionately call him, Nedwin. <laughs> Edwin Booth is probably best known to us as the brother of John Wilkes Booth, the man who shot Abraham Lincoln. Just three months before John Wilkes caused the greatest national tragedy of his time, he and his two brothers, Edwin and Junius, performed in Julius Caesar together as a benefit for the Shakespeare statue that today stands in Central Park. 
But Booth, to 19th century Americans, was the greatest American tragedian, particularly renowned for his performances of Hamlet. A critic for the New York Post summed it up Booth's appeal when he said, Booth had made Hamlet not just acceptable to an audience of learned critics, but absolutely popular with the common people. That's my boy, making Shakespeare popular. <laughs> so before we get started in earnest, I wanted to define a few messy terms for you, which I'm going to be using frequently today. The first is acting edition. For the purposes of this project, an acting edition is a professionally printed version of a script which was available to sale to the general public like this edition from Dramatist Play Service. The second term is prompt book. Now I'm using this term in two ways. The first is prompt book, all one word, all lowercase, which indicates a print edition that has been marked by a stage manager or actor for production like this edition here. The second use of the term references Booth's prompt book editions, two words, capital letters, uh, which uh, began to be published in 1878 and is the main topic of my book. The final term is workbook, which indicates, indicates a text that Booth was working on for production or publication. Booth's workbooks come in two kinds, as you can see above, manuscript and cut and paste. All of these forms of producing scripts were used by Booth in his long career. Prologue, before the prompt books. The earliest acting editions as performed by Edwin Booth began to be published in the mid-1860s. These editions were first conceived by William Stewart, who co-managed the Winter Theatre Garden with Booth and his brother-in-law, John Sleeper Clark, from 1864 to 1867. Stewart thought printed acting editions would serve as a good form of publicity for the star. The first volume printed was Hamlet, to commemorate Booth's epic 100-night run of the play, performed from November 26, 1864, to March 22, 1865. The volume was likely slated for production in the spring of 1865, but was delayed due to Booth's brothers John Wilkes's infamous assassination of President Lincoln on April 15, 1865. In early 1865, Booth's fellow actor and aspiring publisher, Henry L. Hinton, also approached Booth with a proposal to publish a collection of the plays he performed, but Stewart did not entrust Hinton with the Hamlet publication. Instead, in January of 1866, the printing house Baker and Goodwin published Hamlet. The publication coincided with Booth's return to the stage as Hamlet on January 3, 1866, his first appearance following the assassination. As Gary J. Williams has argued, this performance of Hamlet, and I argue the accompanying publication, reestablished Booth's career and lent his Hamlet a national resonance, as the tragedy of Booth's Hamlet mourning his murdered father became that of the nation. The evidence suggests that Booth's interest and involvement in this first publication was incredibly low. Mere days after the volume was published, Booth disparaged it as a cheap affair. There is no record of his contribution to the volume, and indeed the text produced bears little relation to his ideal text of the play represented in his Hamlet workbooks. The text was printed in a double column format, like the popular press editions of Shakespeare, such as Charles Knight's pictorial edition. It also featured the engraving of Booth and Hamlet, and the quotation central to Booth's conception of the character, I am essentially not in madness, but mad in craft, and a reproduction of his signature. Additionally, the volume boasts six woodcuts taken from set designer Charles Witham's designs, which represented the play as staged at the Winter Garden in 1864, and a reproduction of the playbill from March 22, 1865, the historic 100th performance. With these additions, the publication provided audiences with a record of the performance that they could take home and then see the play again. There's some chairs in the front. That same year, theatrical publisher Samuel French, who some of us may have heard of, published Hamlet as produced by Edwin Booth. Yet the publication was not a new edition, but the Baker and Goodwin edition wrapped in Samuel French covers and prefatory advertisements. In the book, I go into more depth about other pirated copies of Booth's acting editions and elucidate what this fluidity of printing indicated about 19th century theatrical printing and production. 
In January of 1866, once Booth had returned to the stage and the first edition of Hamlet had been published, he renewed the subject of publishing the rest of his acting editions with Henry L. Hinton. It was Hinton's ambition to produce a complete series of Booth's acting text, which could be sold cheaply at the theater. During the mid-1860s, Booth was crafting new cuttings of Shakespeare's plays for production at the Winter Garden. In these new versions, Booth was attempting to restore Shakespeare's language, turning from the 18th century adaptations that had held the stage for a generation. As a theatrical rather than a literary editor, Booth wanted to do a stage test of his cuttings in front of an audience before he would commit to printing them. Otherwise, he ran the risk of having his print edition not accurately represent the work on the stage, as was the case with the Baker and Goodwin Hamlet. Due to this precaution, Booth wondered to Hinton, quote, would it not be, therefore be better to wait until after all the plays have been arranged and acted before publishing a more complete edition? The first of Hinton's editions, The Merchant of Venice, was published in 1867 by C.A. Alvord. Hinton produced the volume according to Booth's wishes in time for it to be sold at Booth's revival at the Winter Garden Theater on January 28, 1867. As with the Baker and Goodwin Hamlet, the text was printed in a double column format with several illustrations, lending it the appearance of a popular illustrated edition of Shakespeare. So this is the Charles Knight I showed you earlier, and this is Hinton's version. So you can see how he's essentially mimicking what Knight was doing. While Hinton capitalized on the text association with Booth, he did not claim it was Booth's text. Rather, he described it as a new adaptation to the stage with notes, original and selected, and introductory articles by Henry L. Hinton, making it sound like Hinton himself was the editor of the text. Yet there is evidence that Booth was closely collaborating with Hinton on the formation of this Merchant of Venice. Throughout October and November of 1866, Booth sent Hinton numerous letters expressing his wishes regarding the preface and the images and asking Stewart and stage manager Joseph G. Handley to provide Hinton with the theater's prompt book. And yes, that is his handwriting. And yes, I have transcribed all of his letters he ever wrote. It's amazing I can see as well as I can. Booth cut the text for the theater's prompt book and proofed Hinton's edition for errors. In addition to textual accuracy, Booth was invested in ensuring that the print acting editions accurately represented the scenery and costuming he was employing in his productions. When Booth and Clark took over the management of the Winter Garden Theater in 1864, they committed to producing Shakespeare in the pictorial, historically accurate style which Charles Keene had made his hallmark at the Princess Theater in London in the 1840s. And this is his uh, scenery for Midsummer Night's Dream, which is set in Athens. They devoted a considerable amount of time and money to the design of each production. Accordingly, Booth wished that Hinton's acting editions would also record and promote the visual splendor of his productions. Hinton therefore included a description of the correct costuming for the piece and images of the scenery. As Booth instructed Hinton, quote, I think the illustrations to such a work should be exact copies of the scenes as they are represented when I act, or in other words, as they are produced at the Winter Garden when scenery and costume are gotten up expressly for me. The descriptions and illustrated prom illustrations promoted Booth's productions, gave audiences a lasting memento of their experience in the theater, and recorded details of production which might otherwise be lost to historians. Notwithstanding Booth's wish to wait until all the plays had been arranged and acted to begin to publish, Hinton pressed forward th with the project in late 1866, making his own arrangements of Shakespeare's plays. He did send manuscript copies of his cuttings to Booth for approval, but due to Booth's touring schedule, he rarely had the time or mental energy to fully proof Hinton's work. For instance, in his response to Hinton's King Lear, Booth wrote, quote, I have read it as carefully as I well could under the circumstances, and have marked with pencil one or two alterations, very slight, and several omissions, which he thought would, quote, make it act closer to my own acting text. Other cuttings, such as Hinton's Richard III, did not meet with Booth's approval at all. Hinton's Richard III returned to Shakespeare's text with several cuts and some minor transpositions. But despite his trimming, Booth feared Hinton's version was way too long and would tire audiences who knew Collie Sibber's short and snappy adaptation as Richard III. Despite Hinton's eagerness to publish all the plays in Booth's repertory, 
The project did not move forward until 1868. After the fire at the Winter Garden in March of 1867, Booth embarked on an extended tour of the Mideast and South to raise funds to build his own theater. As the establishment of Booth's theater became a reality in the spring of 1868, Booth again became, e became eager to have his acting editions published. He resumed discussions with Hinton regarding the project, hoping to begin with Romeo and Juliet, the inaugural production of Booth's theater. In May of 1868, Booth provided Hinton with his cutting of Romeo and Juliet. I have cut r &J to the stage, Booth wrote, confessing, I have desecrated Shakespeare a little here and there by changing or transforming a word or two. While Booth was committed to restoring Shakespeare's texts, he still knew the limits of his audience's attention. He wrote Hinton, quote, I deem it safer to risk the critic's, critic's dam than bore my auditors with an overly lengthy and poetic play. We've all been there, right? <laughs> Booth planned to use the book as a tool for his acting company as well, and to have it for sale in the theater. He instructed Hinton, quote, it would be as well to have three books as ready as soon as possible, and just as I have marked this one, that the actors, who aren't well acquainted with the true version, may have no excuse for imperfectness in their several roles. They are very apt to follow the stage copies, meaning the old copies, even when they know the original is required of them, pleading ignorance as their excuse for laziness. With Booth's acting edition in hand, his cast had no excuse for not speaking the lines the way he wished. The firm Howden, Heard and Houghton published the edition in January of 1869 in time for it to be used in rehearsals, as well as be for sale at the opening of the production and the theater on February 3rd, 1869. Because the volume was printed before rehearsals actually began, the Dramatis Personae didn't actually list the cast or the opening date. Rather, Hinton printed blank lines for audiences to fill in that information for themselves. Almost like a little fantasy team. <laughs> the edition also featured a corienda with a list of transpositions made at the last moment in putting the play upon the stage. As Hinton explained, in producing a spectacle so grand and complicated as the present one, such changes are inevitable and cannot be well foreseen. Due to motives I have not yet unearthed, the publication of Romeo and Juliet, despite all of Booth's wishes, was not Hinton's priority. Before publishing this play, Hinton, along with publishers Hurd and Houghton, brought out a second edition of Merchant of Venice and editions of Richard III and Macbeth in December of 1868. These acting editions were likely not Booth's versions, but the versions that Hinton edited and planned to publish in 1866 without Booth's input. All four of these editions were promoted as being adapted from the text of the Cambridge editors, and these three, erroneously, as being Booth's performance texts, which has led to many people believing that Booth based all of his scripts on the Cambridge, which is wrong. By November of 1869, Booth refused to continue with these editions. He advised Hinton, quote, do not invest one penny more in the venture, as he had found that audiences did not purchase the books and even grumbled about, quote, the practice of peddling in theaters, meaning that he didn't, people didn't want stuff sold in the, the lobby. He discovered that many other theater managers forbade the practice of selling acting editions in the lobby. The this preoccupation, precaution taken by others made Booth rethink allowing sales in his own theater. He went forward with the sales at Booth's theater merely to aid Hinton in recovering the printing costs for Romeo and Juliet. Yet Hinton did not stop publication, continuing to release acting editions as played by Edwin Booth without Booth's buy-in. The actor's annoyance with Hinton grew as between 1869 and 1875 he published six more of Booth's editions three Shakespeare, which you can see here, and three by other authors. Hinton's bold assumption of Booth's name on these acting editions has had lasting ramifications for Booth's legacy. During these years, Booth's theater became a larger and more weighty financial burden for the star, who lost the building in an 1873 bankruptcy suit. In 1878, Booth described his experience with Hinton thusly. He chose to follow his own plan, and the result was a great expense to him and a useless lot of rubbish. I have frequently forbidden their sales in different cities because purchasers naturally complained of their being unlike the acted play. 
but somehow they got in the hands of many hawkers all over the country. To offer audiences his, his authentic acting editions, along with the desire to help a friend, caused Booth to revisit the idea of publishing acting editions. The resulting project was the Edwin Booth Prompt Books, edited by dramatic critic William Winter and published from 1879 to 1919. Booth did not idly choose Winter as his editor. Winter was the most influential American theater critic in the late 19th century. His critical work in newspaper columns, biographies, and stage histories in the United States and England earned him the title Dean of American Drama Critics. Educated at Harvard, Winter was the dramatic critic for the New York Tribune from 1865 to 1909. Winter first saw Booth on stage in April of 50, 1857, but began to know him as an individual in the spring of 1860. Winter's wife Elizabeth was an actress in the first part of her career, and a playwright in the second half, and appeared as Catherine to Booth's Petruchio in 1866. But it was not until 1869 that the two men developed a close friendship. In April of 1876, Booth wrote to Winter wondering, quote, would it be any service to you to edit an acting edition of all the plays I perform? As a dramatic critic, Winter was paid a scanty salary by the Tribune, which he supplemented with freelance writing. Booth hoped, quote, to do something towards making it a source of some little profit to you, desiring none for myself beyond the gratification of having such a book in use. Booth anticipated that the volumes would, quote, sell like hotcakes wherever I perform, and you, Winter, could thus derive a pretty good return for your labor. Either Booth had forgotten his difficulties in selling the Hinton volumes in the late 1860s, or he believed theaters had changed their attitudes towards the sale of acting editions. Booth supplied the capital for the venture, paying for the printer's fees and the casting of stereographic plates. His interest was in making the project remunerative for Winter, and it was so great he was even willing to wait for the return of my outgo, meaning for him to get his money back, until Winter reaped some financial benefit from the project. The hope was that the proceeds from the sales would enable Winter to finally purchase a home for his growing family. Booth also saw the books as a way to continue the work he began at Booth's theater. In creating his own theater, Booth hoped to permanently establish what he called the true drama in New York, with fully mounted, historically accurate productions of Shakespeare in Booth's own cuttings rather than the 18th century adaptations. In the years since the Hinton publications and the fall of Booth's theater, Booth had restored several more of Shakespeare's texts, such as his 1875 King Lear at Daly's Theater in New York, and this is the workbook that led to that production. The prompt book series therefore allowed him a second chance to establish the true drama. In the prompt books, he could put forward an ideal text, he could take the time to make textual choices based on scholarly opinion and his own considerable experience, rather solely on running time and the abilities of his actors. Unlike Booth's theater, which had proven to be as ephemeral as theatrical performance itself, the printed prompt books had permanence. They provided Booth the opportunity to record his interpretations, interpretations of Shakespeare for posterity, to create a lasting monument to the Edwin Booth brand. Booth also, as with the Hinton Romeo and Juliet, wanted actors in his company to use his editions to prepare for their productions. The prompt books soon became instrumental in the many touring productions Booth starred in for the rest of his career. Actress Kitty Maloney, who toured with Booth in the 1886-1887 season, recalled that her first action when, it, when embarking on the tour was to buy the Booth prompt books to study on the train to Buffalo, which was the first tour stop. Not only did the editions make these productions easier to mount, the use of them by his contemporaries added prestige to Booth's unique cuttings of the plays. Therefore, as Booth and Winter formulated their plan for the volumes in 1876, Booth insisted that the layout facilitate work in the theater. In Booth's experience, the Hinton editions, which had been printed on both recto and verso, so that's both sides of the page, in double columns, were not useful to theatrical practitioners. As you can see here, Booth awkwardly attempted to write theatrical notes and stage directions in the bottom margin. Booth warned Winter against this format. Quote, be sure and avoid double columns for the book. It is not good for theatrical purposes. Booth instructed Winter to leave the left side of the fold blank because, quote, all prompters prefer and will do it to write in very large letters the directions which are already printed. 
Besides, some actors may have different notions of many directions I might publish, and I think it best to leave such details as property lists, scene plots, calls, music, and curtain bells, lights up, etc., etc., for the different stars or managers who might use the book. As I discuss in the second half of the book, many actors, both professionals and amateurs, use the prompt books in precisely this way, as seen in this example, um, actor Robert B. Mantel's prompt book of King Lear, based on Booth's acting edition. Throughout 1877, Booth and Winter searched for a printer who produced high quality editions but at a reasonable cost. They knew that the slim volumes would only be able to retail between 25 and 50 cents. Therefore, if they were to recoup their outlay, they had to be printed at a correspondingly low price. As Booth reminded Winter, quote, the book must not be unwieldy nor beyond the reach in price of the playgoer. Benjamin B. Russell, the first printer Winter, Winter approached for the project, offered an estimate which was too costly. Booth recommended they seek out William Moore, who had worked as the doorkeeper for him at Booth's theater, and who had printed plays and pamphlets for Booth at a low cost. Regardless of the publisher, it was important to Booth that the venture would offer, quote, some chance for profit. Winter, however, wished to have the books printed at a reputable print house to ensure their quality. He suggested they consider Boston printer James R. Osgood, who had worked at the well-established firm of Tickner and Fields before establishing his own print house, James R. Osgood and Company, in 1870. They finally chose the firm of Francis Hart and Company, a highly respected print house in New York, helmed by printer Theodore Lowe Davini. Davini was an influential young publisher who, in the words of John Tebble, quote, was turning out the most beautiful books of his time. Divini may have also been of interest to Winter, as he was a scholar of printmaking and print history, as well as being one of the foremost book designers of the day. Booth urgently wanted to have the first prompt book available for sale during his return engagement at Booth's Theater in January of 1878, his first return since he lost the theater to bankruptcy in 1873. He planned to open with his new cutting of Richard III, his own edition based on Shakespeare's text, not Colley Sibber's adaptation. It was important to Booth that this text was the inaugural play in the prompt book series, and it would be for sale for, at opening. Due to the solid deadline of January opening night, the publication of Richard III was rushed. Winter completed the preface and appendix to the volume on Christmas Day, 1877. This allowed only two weeks for proofing and printing. In preparing all of their volumes, Booth cut and arranged the text on his own, referring to the stage manager's prompt books and scholarly editions. He then sent the manuscript copy to Winter, who wrote the preface and appendix, and sent the completed text to the printer. The first proofs were delivered to Booth for his approval. Winter made a second proof and delivered the edited copy back to Divini. That was sort of the basic rhythm. But for many plays in the series, this timeline was complicated because of Winter's heavy writing load and Booth's touring and rehearsal schedule. On January 7, 1878, Booth performed his new arrangement of Shakespeare's Richard III, and according to plan, audiences were able to purchase the first edition of the prompt book series that night. The existence of the prompt book in the theater had an unintended consequence. It made the audience aware of any deviation from the text. Following his opening, Booth Riley observed, quote, Nervousness, nervousness nearly upset me last night and threw me back with Sibber two or three times, and I see the critics notice my imperfectness. All of the company were half scared out of their wits, too. The added pressure of the audience, and especially the critics, knowing the correct text, was nerve-wracking for Booth and his company. I mean, like, they followed along with them. <laughs> so if you win up, everybody knew. Despite these challenges, Booth was pleased with the product. He immediately wrote to Winter during his second performance of the play on January 8th to register his delight. Quote, the book is splendid, he enthused. But I see two or three errors have crept in, which he and Winter corrected for a second edition. And this is the marked up prompt book for the corrections. The success of the prompt book of Richard III made Booth eager to get out Hamlet, the next title he would perform at Booth's theater beginning on January 21st. As the most popular title in Booth's repertory, Hamlet was a clear priority if the prompt books would be a financial as well as literary success. The timeline was again tight, and the editors did not meet their deadline. Booth finished his final edits for, on the text on February 6, 1878, and Winter completed the preface the next day. 
Before Hamlet was complete, Booth was already turning his sights to the next volume. He informed Winter on February 6th, I'm sorry to tell you that I must do Richard II when he moved to the Boston Theater on March 4th. He therefore wanted that volume, rather than King Lear, which Winter had been working on, ready next. Due to Booth's urgent desire to sell the books at the opening, he and Winter again rushed through the publication process. Winter completed the preface to Richard II a quick six days later on February 12th and straight away sent the text to Divini for printing. Due to this haste, neither Hamlet nor Richard II featured an appendix and the rushed volumes contained several errors that had to be corrected in subsequent editions. By March, Booth realized their project might not be financially remunerative. He reluctantly told Winter, quote, the books are not such a go as we anticipated they would be. The sale is very slow and all complain of the price. Booth went into the venture thinking that an outlay of $1,000 would cover all the publishing of all the volumes and would be quickly made up in sales. He always was an optimist. By April of 1878, he feared that the expenses would treble that account. So he feared it would be over $3,000. Therefore, throughout the early sales of the prompt books, Booth fretted about the cost. Most other acting editions, such as those published by Samuel French, retailed for between 15 and 25 cents a piece. But at that price, Booth knew it would take several years to get the much needed proceeds to winter and even longer for him to recoup his initial outlay. Due to the blank recto pages, the prompt book volumes were twice as expensive to print as other acting editions. They considered doubling the traditional price, but Booth was afraid 50 cents would scare buyers off. They initially set the books at 40 cents each, as sort of a compromise, but Silverstone, the selling agent in the theaters, often took it into his own hands to lower the price to 35 cents to encourage sales. Booth soon came around to Silverstone's point of view and had the price lowered. Yet there was still pushback about the high price. Theater manager John T. Ford wished that Booth would issue a 25 cent edition without the blank pages, but Booth, quote, told him its absence would destroy the object of the book which for Booth was to be useful to working actors. Booth saw the need to diversify the locations the prompt books were available for sale as they were not making the money he wished from sales at the theater himself. He proposed to Winter, quote, I think they should be left in each city at some live bookshop and advertised. Winter accordingly set up a contract in March of 1878 with Lee and Shepherds in Boston and the New York bookseller Brentano's on Fifth Avenue in October of 1878. Arrangements for sales in bookstores were also made with Charles T. Dillingham in New York and the Rand Avery and Company in Boston, who we now know as people that publish maps. To promote the sales of the volumes, in April, Winter began publicizing the release of each new volume in the new publications column of the New York Tribune. Today, I want to look at the blurb from May 3rd, 1878. In this short promotional piece, Winter took sole credit for the formation and editing of the volume, going so far as to refer to the project as William Winter's prompt book. Booth casually pointed this out, writing, quote, by the by, I notice that the notices of the books don't give me any credit for the arrangement of the plays. Winter's reply and any explanation for his actions has unfortunately been lost. William Booth was a, I mean, Edwin Booth was a big burner of letters for which Booth, always modest, was not actually perturbed by the lack of credit for what he called his, quote, feeble part in the business. Yet Winter's presumption has had a lasting influence, with many people to this day believing Winter edited the texts as well as writing the prefatory material. Despite his worries about the commercial appeal of the volumes and the growing cost to himself, Booth wished to push forward with the project. Now it was underway, Winter wanted to publish all of Booth's repertory. Booth was hesitant to do so, both due to the cost, and as the versions of Henry VIII and the Merchant of Venice he regularly produced, quote, would be regarded as a terrible mutilation by the critics. Booth traditionally played these pieces as part of a double bill, often with David Garrick's Catherine and Petruchio, an adaptation of Taming of the Shrew. So a double bill was where you had two really short plays that you got to see in one evening as opposed to sitting through all of Hamlet. In fact, in the 1880s, Merchant and Shrew were printed as a double bill volume of the prompt books. So if you went and saw the double bill, you could get the double bill book. He wrote to Winter, quote, 
Were it not that Shylock is so prominent in my repertory, I'd advise the omission of that play as part of the prompt book series, but it is too important a character and too often acted to be left out. While Booth acknowledged that all the Shakespearean texts he performed were abridgments, he did not want to publish the true mutilations, fearing that he would lose his reputation as a restorer of Shakespeare. For similar reasons, Booth was anxious about the prompt book editions of Othello and Macbeth, as he was often obliged to change much in the representation of them, as he said, according to the exigencies of the theaters and companies in different towns. For example, Booth would often excise the willow scene in Othello, so it says there, this scene sometimes ends here, if Desdemona couldn't sing. Because <laughs> so you don't want her singing the song if she can't sing. And he would get to a theater, realize the girl that they have for him there actually can't sing, they'd cut the scene. Winter persuaded Booth to publish all the remaining plays in his repertory, with the exception of Julius Caesar. Lear and Richelieu by Edward Bur Bulwer Lytton were published in mid-April. The copyright records for Macbeth and Othello indicate those volumes were published in July, and the copyright records are what we're looking at here. And the final volumes were released in the fall of 1878. The Merchant of Venice and Catherine and Petruchio in November, and Henry VIII and Much Ado in December. So this is actually how they kept track of the copyright records. It's an index card with titles on it. Isn't that crazy? On April 25th, 1879, William Winter's involvement with the prompt books ended. On that date, he signed a bill of sale ceding to Edwin Booth the copyright of all 15 volumes of the prompt books, the Electra plates held by Francis Hart and Company, the $800 insurance policy on the plates by Adriatic Fire Insurance Company of New York, and all remaining print copies which were held by the booksellers Lee and Shepard in Boston and C.T. Dillingham in New York. Booth accordingly paid Winter $1,000. This money enabled Winter to buy a house on Staten Island. That's his office. With the transfer of the copyright, there were still several loose ends. Firstly, Booth still owed Francis Hart and Company money for the reprinting of Richard III. Secondly, there were many unsold volumes. Winter reported that Lee and Shepard had 3,749 volumes on hand, and if sold, will earn $937.25. Winter was not certain the books would sell at the rate they anticipated, as the bookseller hadn't sold any copies, quote, this last quarter, and the books only netted $272 in the theater during that same time. He advised Booth, quote, perhaps the most immediate way to recover the original investment would be to sell the plates and copyright to some theatrical publisher at about the cost. After a year or two of sales of the book, new editions will not cost much. Booth, never a financial genius, did not follow this advice. Despite the labor and headaches, Winter was pleased with the work he and Booth had completed in producing the prompt books. He wrote Booth, quote, I feel a great pride in the work we have done together and shall always be glad that we were thus associated in an enterprise most useful to the stage and credible to the literature of our time. Winter was also the financial winner in the arrangement as, according to my calculations, Booth paid over $4,500 just for typesetting the original prompt books. This figure does not include paper, binding, illustration costs, or the cost of making changes to the volumes for the second and third editions. And Winter made about $1,500 on the venture. After Winter stepped away from the book, prompt book project, Booth's longtime stage manager, John Henry McGonigal, took over supervising the publication and sales of the volumes. Booth's valet, Frank Lodge, was tasked with the transport of the volumes, and McGonigal kept record of all the sales. Several volumes of the prompt book were printed by Divini and Francis Hart and Company in 1881. After this point, the prompt books began to be printed by a variety of publishers. In the late 1800s, new, prompt books, new editions of the prompt books were published, reflecting Booth's collaborative tours with Tommaso Salvini, Lawrence Barrett, and Helena Majeska, among others. While few records of the sales of the prompt books exist, there is an ex exant record from Booth's final season, 1890 to 91, in which he essayed a limited East Coast tour with his actor-manager partner of several years, Lawrence Barrett. As was his custom, McGonagall managed the tour and kept record, record of the prompt book sales. McGonagall's records indicate that the public was still interested in purchasing the prompt books as part of their theater-going experience, although they had been on sale and available for 12 years now. 
The records demonstrate Booth's earlier conviction that the public was most interested in buying the volumes as part of viewing each production. For instance, when the tour played the Lyceum Theater in Baltimore for two weeks, they didn't perform Julius Caesar during the first week and made no sales of the prompt book. The second week, they played Julius Caesar twice and sold 20 copies. Othello was performed during both weeks of the engagement, and the book sold during both weeks, 15 during the first week, 23 during the second. Booth was playing Iago in the second week, which was the more popular of his two roles. But as these numbers indicate, not that many patrons purchased them. The Lyceum sat 1,300 people. If the performance sold out, only about 2 to 3% of people purchased a prompt book. In addition to selling the books at the theater, McGonagall continued to offer them for sale at Brentano's booksellers on Fifth Avenue in New York. His records indicate that while the prompt books did sell there, only the most popular titles were purchased, with Hamlet and Othello selling better than any other book. These statistics are unsurprising, as Hamlet was Booth's most well-known and popular performance, and Othello was the biggest draw of the Booth-Barrett combination. The last performance of Edwin Booth's career occurred on April 4, 1891, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. He died in his home at the Players Club on, in New York on June 7, 1893. Surprisingly, Booth made no mention of the prompt books or who should control them in his will. Yet, in 1894, the Penn Publishing Company reprinted four of the volumes, and in 1899, the books were reprinted as a special two-volume set, the Shakespearean plays of Edwin Booth and the miscellaneous plays of Edwin Booth, with new introductions written by William Winter. This leaves me, as a historian, with many questions. As the executor of the will, did McGonagall re re regain control of the remaining stock and the stereographic plates? Or did Booth's daughter Edwina? Might there be no mention of the prompt books because the plates were sold before his death? If that is the case, who bought them? Was it Winter or was it Penn? Who hold the copyright for these volumes and who reaped the financial benefits of Booth's acting editions? It remains a frustrating mystery, which I hope I find the answer to before I publish the book. <laughs> so, what does all this tell us about the history of the American theater and print industry? In other words, Leslie, why are you even bothering to write this book? <laughs> Nedwin is so confused. <laughs> the first reason is that there is no book history of theatrical editions, other than the plethora of writings about Shakespeare's folios and quartos. I am therefore treating the Edwin Booth prompt book editions as a micro-history, which reveals larger trends in the printing, distribution, and use of acting editions. I'm especially interested in using these volumes to track the theatrical circulation of these texts, because unlike other acting editions, Booth's series was purposefully planned for active use in the theater, and was used actively in the theater. All the way through, Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet is based off of an Edwin Booth prompt book. From a historian's point of view, a published acting edition is one of our key pieces of evidence, which tells us what words were said on stage, where people stood, and what effects were included. As I have revealed in our short time together today, the lack of research into Booth's acting editions have caused historians to come to incorrect conclusions regarding how to use the texts, such as falsely relying on Hinton's editions as Booth's acting editions, and assuming that Winter rather than Booth was the textual editor of the prompt books. My research uncovers these pieces of misinformation and will, I hope, encourage other theater historians to deeply consider the textual history of the acting editions they rely on to produce their historical fact. Thank you for taking the time out of your afternoon to allow me to share my work with you. And now I believe we have about 20 minutes for questions, 15 minutes for questions. So questions. I'm going to take a drink of water while you think about things. I'm going to change mics. Oh, that was a terrible idea. OK, there we go. So Phil has one? Where can they be viewed? Um, many, many, many places. So uh, I've been to, we don't have any here. Um, they have a couple at Reno. Um, uh, I've been to probably 15 libraries so far um, with with them, uh, the, the primary, they're primarily at uh, the Hampton Booth Library, which is upstairs in the Players Club, which is essentially like I'm sitting up there doing my research above Edwin Booth's bedroom. 
um, which is awesome, but also really weird because it's essentially the slave quarters um, uh, where I'm up there doing my research. Um, uh, and the Folger has a number of them. Uh, the Folger Shakespeare Library has a, a number of them, so I spent much of my Folger fellowship there uh, looking at them. But you know, like Berkeley has some, Princeton has some, Har Harvard has some, where else have I been? Uh, the University of Chicago has some, uh, Columbia has, I mean, there, 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 there are lots of places. And because they were purchased by people, who had them as their editions of Shakespeare, um, they're all over the place. So one of the, the, the things that I'm really excited about is looking at amateur actors and how amateur actors um, who are just like you and me doing a show in our living room still use the booth editions because you could buy them for not that much. Thanks, Phil, that's a great question. Yeah, Daz. Do the plates still exist or were they lost the history of the ownership? I don't know. Um, I don't know. So the, the reason there is so much I don't know about this last chapter is that the pen publishing company caught on fire. Um, so I don't know a lot about that last chapter because I, I assume all those records are at pen and that they, they burnt up. Um, the other thing is that even Divini, who is a very uh, well-known publisher, the Grolier Club in New York is his um, uh, archive. Uh, they don't have any of the records of an acting edition because it's just theater. Why do we care? You know, like there's tons of editions of these beautiful illustrated volumes that he did, but nothing about any of the theatrical work he did. And the booth volumes weren't the only volumes that he published, um, but there aren't any records, which makes my job really hard. I would say a little of both. So essentially what happened is uh, Wilkes, so I call him Wilkes because that's what the family called him. I feel like I'm like part of the family. When you read ev everybody's personal letters, you start feeling like you really know them. Um, uh, and like how bad his stomach was each day. You, you, like you really know him. Um, so Wilkes, um, he had a terrible stomach, my poor little boy, Nedwin. Um, so Wilkes, uh, Wilkes shot the president and immediately they rounded up the family and um, his brother Junius was put in jail. Uh, Booth was actually supposed to, he was at the Boston Theater that night, he was supposed to be playing Macbeth and essentially the manager came in and was like, you're not going on tonight. Um, and they canceled the show. Um, and he retired from the stage uh, from April uh, 1865 through January of 66 and he told people he's never going back, never ever going back. So essentially what happened is his friends uh, started a letter writing campaign to the New York newspapers to say we want Edwin Booth to come back. So essentially he was able to come back by popular demand. But I think that what he did with Hamlet and sort of that transformation of Hamlet into this figure that was, that, that became a symbol of the country really helped him to move forward. Um, and uh, the other thing was that there, there were a number of like personal anecdotes about him. Um, for instance, Edwin Booth saved Abraham Lincoln's son from dying once. They were at a train station and Todd Lincoln got jostled by somebody and fell onto the tracks and the train was coming and Booth jumped down and pulled Todd Lincoln out. So there were these like little, little weird stories that helped um, him to re sort of regra regain his image. He also wrote a, most, a beautiful, eloquent letter about how much he supported the Union and he supported Lincoln and he voted for Lincoln um, and that he, how reprehensibly he fought, found his brother's act. But an interesting thing, he never acted in Washington DC ever again. The closest he ever got was Baltimore and they had to do like a special train up from DC for anybody in DC that wanted to see him. He never went to DC ever again. Yeah. So Sam French was making money. During the same time period, Sam French was making money on it. Um, and part of the way they did that was volume. You know, Sam French was putting out thousands of titles. And what they would do is they would wholesale buy plates. So they would get the plates for like the entire uh, London theater. And they'd just get them all. And then they'd just like start churning them out. 
Um, so, so Sam French was making money at this point in time, um, but the, because the booth books are such a small enterprise, and he is essentially self-publishing them, uh, that's part of why he's not making money. But for Booth, it was always a means of recording. Yeah, so for him, it was always an artistic purpose. Um, I mean, he wanted to get that money for winter, but I don't think he ever wanted to really make money off of them, which is good, because I don't think he ever did. I think, I think they ultimately were a financial fail for him, which was not the only financial fail he ever had. You know, Booth's Theater was, he, he was $3 million in debt after Booth's Theater, um, which he made up again in about six years because he was the most popular actor in America. By the end of his career, people were paying $5 to come see him, which is insane because you could go to see a show for 25 cents. Yeah. Do you find yourself uh, in agreement with them or they are in opposition to what your uh, factor are leading, where your facts are leading you? I don't know anybody else that is doing the work I'm doing. So there's no one disagreeing with you. Yep. <laughs> well, that's not true. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm sort of revitalizing a, a, a sort of line of historical inquiry that was uh, very popular in the 70s. So a lot of the people that were doing what I'm doing are dead. Um, uh, uh, but there is one, um, uh, one guy named Daniel Watermeyer who just put out a, a lovely uh, biography of Booth um, uh, called American Tragedian. Uh, uh, I have two copies of it, if anybody wants to read it. Um, uh, that, uh, and Dan has been an incredible use to me. I mean, you saw the handwriting. So one of the things, Dan is one of the only other people I know that has transcribed all of those letters. So me being able to email him and be like, what, what, what is he saying here? Do you have a guess? Um, so that's been hugely helpful. But um, I mean, what I do is, is, in, is different because I do look at text and performance. And there aren't many people that do that. You're either a textual scholar or you're a performance scholar. And I'm one of the few people that are right in the middle. Yeah, Olivia. Yes, very different. So uh, uh, as an example, uh, the Merchant of Venice that he used for most of his career doesn't have an act five. Shylock leaves and curtain. So I mean like the last stage direction is like Shylock shuffles away upstage and then the curtain comes down. We don't go back to Belmont. We don't see the lovers get back together. None of that happens because the star actor's off the stage. Why do we care? Um, uh, so, I mean, he did, did, in the tour with Lawrence Barrett that he did in the uh, 1880s, they brought that scene back because Barrett was playing um, uh, Bassanio. So. Um, there have been some modern people to use Booth's version. Um, they're actually very good for theatrical production. I mean, that's part of why Zeffirelli uh, used uh, the, the booth Romeo and Juliet as his uh, launching pad because uh, it's already so streamlined and visually oriented because that's what they were doing in the 19th century. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of, somebody, somebody did email me that a theater had recently done one that they said that they based on booth and I can't remember it off the top of my head because I haven't gotten to that part of the book yet. Yeah. I'll get there. Yeah, Dana. Yeah, so essentially in the 1760s, David Garrick did this adaptation of it, which cut it down to its bare bones. Um, uh, it's about uh, an hour and 10 minutes, uh, and it's just Catherine and Petruchio. So it's sort of like a greatest hits. You know, you don't have to deal with all that other stuff. You just get people bashed over the head with lutes and that sort of thing. Um, uh, Chris and I would really love to do it for Shakespeare's birthday this year. So um, stay tuned. That might happen. Have they been anthologized in any way, so you can sort of look at them all in one the, the one Shakes volume? This, the, the, those two volumes that were published by Penn in 1899, the Shakespearean plays of Edwin Booth and the, um, uh, the miscellaneous plays of Edwin Booth are the, the anthology. They're in the R library? Maybe? Okay. No, we don't, no, we don't have them here. There's no modern version. There's no modern version of them. If somebody would like to have somebody edit them, I'd be a great person to do that. <laughs> But so the thing is with acting editions is uh, the scholarly edition has trumped right. 
the acting edition. We are much more interested in a scholarly edition of Shakespeare than we ever would be in an acting edition of Shakespeare, which I'm sure many of us in this room think is very stupid. Um, uh, but until they start shifting the publication uh, industry, I mean, maybe I should pitch that. I should pitch that. Yeah. Yeah, Des, did you have another? Are there any legal repercussions that came about from other publishers using Booth's name without his endorsement of the edition? No. So here's the thing about copyright in the United States. Um, uh, what, during the time that uh, Hinton was publishing all of those volumes without Booth's name, that was not illegal in the United States. Um, it was not until 1869 when Augustine Daly sued um, some people for using the, uh, uh, his melodramatic train. Uh, um, so, the, you know, the thing where the girls tie down to the tracks and the train is coming and they pick the girl off of the tracks. Well, it was originally the guy, but um, that uh, melodramatic train effect Augustine Daly claimed was his and was copyrighted by him. So he got a high-powered lawyer to um, essentially claim this suit, and that was the beginning of theatrical copyright in the United States. And one of the things that I'm still working on is what does it mean to copyright a Shakespeare play? Because these plays were copyrighted um, at the Library of Congress. So I don't know what that means yet, because how do you copyright Shakespeare? So I mean, right. So so the, um, the copyright historian that I've talked to thus far says that um, it has to do with the prefatory material and the illustrations. But I think Booth thought he was copywriting his <coughs> version of the plays, and that that was part of what he was doing, um, which is fascinating. And I haven't I haven't gotten all the way into that rabbit hole. John, did you have something? Yeah. I think most people do their own, or we sort of have the little network of, I saw a cool one at the public, oh, I know the literary manager at the public, I'll have her send it to me. Um, uh, so I think those are sort of the two ways that it happens now, but mostly we do our own. However, I, do, I have worked with several directors who have watched a movie and then um, gotten ideas from the movie, which is not always the best plan. Because, you know, movies are edited for that visual effect as opposed to a theatrical effect. Um, but Booth's texts are actually edited for theatrical effect. Um, uh, but it is a 19th century theatrical effect, which is not necessarily a 21st century theatrical effect. Questions? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it seems like Booth was effectively working really dramaturgically, and his the fellow dramaturgs were critics. Yes. More than anything else, how common was it for this sort of actor dramaturg, critic dramaturg, dyke, like what, what was that scene about? Well, you should read my forthcoming article in Theater Annual. <laughs> Thanks for just so feeding me that. That was beautiful. Um, uh, uh, so essentially, uh, there, w there weren't dramaturgs at that point in time. Um, and from this point forward, William Winter becomes a dramaturg uh, in the 19th century. He was a dramaturg for Austin Daly's company, which is what my uh, forthcoming article is about. Um, uh, and also for uh, Minnie Madden Fisk and several other female actors, actor managers in the latter half of the century. Um, uh, I mean, there were, so like uh, Charles McCready had a researcher. Charles Keene had a researcher that helped him with the, the sort of the scenery and the costumes to make sure they were being authentic. But in terms of dramaturgical work, I really think that what Booth and Winter do, are doing is the beginning, as I argue in my forthcoming article, is the beginning of American dramaturgy. Yeah, Jeff. If his acting edition was 35 cents, and was the average cost of the theater ticket 25 cents, so it would cost more to get to buy the edition, right? Well, I mean, those are the cheap seats. Those are the ones for the, like, boys up in the upper galleries. Um, uh, I mean, a, a, a box would be $5. A good seat in the orchestra would be a dollar. But, so, but if the book is 50 cents, that's half the cost of your seat, um, which, you know, inflation in seats has not kept up with inflation in books. Um, but that would be sort of like going to see, you know, Newsies and then buying a $50 copy of Newsies. You know, like, that's insane. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny, because writing it for actors and then selling it to audience members, it was, the, was it like to get the gateway access 
audience what it's like to be an actor in there? I mean, it seems like a, or was it just that the audience decided to compose the actors? Well, no, no, no. I mean, I think it was, I think it was, we'll use it for the actors and then we'll be able to make some money off the audiences. Yeah, that the, but also, you know, things like Kitty, uh, Kitty Maloney had to go buy her own. You know, like this is not the time where we give the actors the scripts. The actors go buy their own scripts. They also bought their own costumes and generally their own train tickets to where they were going. So you guys are being treated very cushy <laughs> these days. Okay, it is after five o'clock, so I'm going to let you all go. Thank you for being here.